It was about a year ago that Dr. MacArthur called me into his office and said, everyone has responded to the invitation to speak at Shepherd's Conference except one man. And I had to apologize, admitting I thought it was either a clerical error on his part or a prank by my fellow associate pastors. Uh, he then assigned me the topic of the sanctification of the church. And then the next Sunday started a series in Galatians that I would entitle The Sanctification of the Church. <laughs> and so through wise counsel, uh, we appealed to him that he should handle that topic. And I have assigned myself the topic of the unity of the church. So will you open your Bibles to Psalm 133. Psalm 133, it is a pleasure to uh, speak to you, a joy, profound, humbling uh, responsibility, and I take it seriously. And I'm grateful, and I know you are as well, that it's not the preacher of the word that we're all about. It's the preaching of the word. And that's what I intend to do. Psalm 133, it's familiar to you. I'll read it. A song of ascents of David. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there Yahweh commanded the blessing, life forever. This is the very word of the living God. In just a few days, you'll be headed home. And it's our prayer that your heart will be full, that your soul will be encouraged, that your shoes will be shined, that your diet will be shipwrecked, that your back will be sore from carrying around that massive preacher's Bible. You may have to buy a one-way ticket for that thing on the airplane. But we love coming to the Shepherds Conference, don't we? Sweet fellowship, the fraternity that we experience here. And when you get home, your wife will pick you up from the airport and she'll say, how was it, sweetheart? And you'll say, good. you master homiletician, you. <laughs> and she'll look at you and say, Pastor, you have such a way with words. What was the conference like? Being with thousands of brother pastors, gospel ministers coming together for encouragement, what was it like? And I think you'll say, my dear, it's like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard even Aaron's beard. And as you pull into the driveway, you'll see your unbelieving neighbor who was good to you because he rolled out your trash cans when you were gone. And he'll ask you, hi neighbor, how was the conference? And you'll say, good. You gifted evangelist, you. <laughs> and your neighbor will say, what, what was it like? A pastor's conference. And you'll look at him and you'll say, honestly, it was like dew. <laughs> Excuse me, did you say dew? <laughs> yes, dew. Like the dew of Mount Hermon descending upon Mount Zion, that's what it was like. What is it like? What is it like to be with God's people at a conference like this one, or at your local minister's fraternal, or more significantly and better, every single Sunday that you gather with your local church family? How do you describe being with God's people? How do you describe the kind of pleasurable joy that we experience in Christian fellowship? 
What is the experience of spiritual unity like? What does it mean to you? What does it contribute to your life? How does it affect you, pastor? How does it make you feel? How does spiritual unity influence the way that you lead and pastor and preach? Before us this afternoon is Psalm 133, full of these seemingly enigmatic illustrations and exclamatory phrases about brethren dwelling together. This is a song inspired by God and intended to move us all to a greater appreciation and understanding of the preciousness of fellowship to provoke us even to praise and value something that God himself praises and values. This ancient hymn was composed in praise to spiritual unity. We're all aware that disunity is a problem as old as Cain and Abel. It's disunity that split Judah into Israel. It's been a pernicious problem in local churches all the way back to Philippi. The call for harmony in our churches and between believers is repeatedly addressed by scripture, sometimes even called out by name in the case of Euodia and Syntyche. In Corinth, the factions were infamous. They claimed the name of their favorite teachers. I'm a truth guy, I like Paul. You know, I, I like the authenticity of Cephas. You know, I'm more for the eloquence of Apollos. He wrote Hebrews, by the way. (laughs) And then the really spiritual, I'm more more a Jesus guy. Knows how to make everybody be quiet. In Philippi, there was the Paulinists and the anti-Paulinists. And so the New Testament is full of appeals like 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. In Ephesians 4, that classic passage on unity, unity and spiritual maturity are are equated. As Paul writes to those believers in Colossae, he tells them, above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Or, Or Peter, aged Peter, writing so tenderly in chapter three, be like-minded, sympathetic, love each other. Over and over again, it'd be hard to find something more repeatedly insisted upon in the New Testament than this issue of togetherness, of unity, of the significance of fellowship. But I wonder, in a crowd like this one, of doctrinally precise pastors, I wonder if we're sometimes suspicious of a call for unity. If the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word unity is the fact that evangelicalism has been diluted by ecumenism, or when you wake up in the morning, your first instinct is to get that itchy trigger finger to log onto Facebook and to correct every incorrect Christian on the internet. I'd like you to listen to an ancient song I think it's time to allow Psalm 133 to remind all of us just how sweet and fundamental fellowship is. Please don't get me wrong. Certainly the scripture calls us to defend the faith, to divide from apostasy and unbelief. And if the integrity of the gospel is compromised and the church's mission is lost, we don't dilute the truth to accommodate as many as possible. We know that there is no unity apart from the truth. That sound doctrine is essential for unity in the church. So we're not trying to pit faithfulness against faithfulness here. We never compromise essential historic biblical doctrine in the name of unity. We don't negotiate on the gospel. And we are well aware of the doctrinal laxity that pretends to accomplish spiritual unity. But are we as aware of the doctrinal over-exuberance that often prohibits it? The Apostle Paul was aware of both. And he addressed both in Corinth. What Ian Murray calls doctrinal indifferentism is dangerous. And the basis of true spiritual unity is the truth, not compromise. But the concern and the need for a song like Psalm 133 is if we ever would tacitly accept disunity as just part of life in a fallen world. And if being committed to the truth has made you suspicious of the word unity, You need to listen to a song that David wrote, Psalm 133. 
It doesn't address the outworkings of unity in all our contexts. Instead, it provides a reminder of the foundational and inherent beauty of spiritual harmony. To be in accord with the people of God is desirable and praiseworthy. The harmony in our local churches is a testimony to a watching world of the love of the body of Christ and the love and commonality we experience in our churches ought to be a pleasing aroma and a life-giving testimony to the vitality and importance of praising and preserving spiritual unity. This song is a celebration of the blessings of covenant fellowship as seen in the unity of believers. Well, let's begin by surrounding it. Look at the context of this little gem that's only three verses long. You could see from the superscription, it's, it's Davidic. It's also a song of ascents or a song of the great ascent. This is that special group of psalms comprising Psalm 120 to 134, sometimes called pilgrim songs, where the people of Israel would come back to Zion, to Jerusalem, to participate in the annual feasts and festivals, to worship the one true God. And as they approached the holy city, this was likely the hymn book that they would use for their journey. As pilgrims sang these songs, Psalm 132, 133, and 134 were especially apropos because they all spoke of Zion. 132 verse 13 says, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. Our psalm in verse three speaks of the mountains of Zion receiving a blessing. Psalm 134 in verse three says, may the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. As they move towards this mountain, it was always up to Jerusalem. Zion was the place they knew where God issued his blessings. And this holy hill that was the locale of Jerusalem was the place where heaven and earth were to meet. Psalm 132 depicts David bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Zion. Psalm 133 pictures God bringing blessings upon Zion. And Psalm 134 reveals that from Zion, God blesses the pilgrims. As David wrote this, we understand that this is a song that God's people have been singing in praise of spiritual unity for thousands of years penned by that shepherd-turned-monarch, harp-player King David. It's a song that was employed throughout Israel's history to this day and eventually compiled into this collection to be the songs of ascent. David experienced this great display of unity of the people of God in 2 Samuel chapter 5 around his kingship, and perhaps that's the occasion of its composition. But... There's so many occasions where this song would have been appropriate. This song would have proved timely in the days of Hezekiah when tensions ran high between Judah and Israel, when the kingdom was not united but divided, when fellowship was broken during the dark days of civil war. This song's celebratory tone would have been an expression of longing for unity and harmony to be restored to the kingdom and a repair of that breach between brothers and tribes. They would hear those words, behold how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in times of unity, this song would be joyful praise and in times of discord, this song would be a longing and a prayer for the restoration of that sweet unity that had been lost. Take a moment to consider its structure, its simple poetry in Hebrew, isn't it? It begins with a blessing A formula of blessing, behold how good and delightful when brothers also at one. And then it has these two illustrations in the middle, the one about oil and the second one about the dew. And then it ends with another pronouncement, uh, an explanation of those illustrations after setting up the situation because there Yahweh commanded the blessing, life forever. So we'll look at it in three parts. Let's begin with in praise of spiritual unity. In praise of spiritual unity. Verse one, behold, behold. Psalm 133 and 134 are the only songs in the entire Psalter that begin with that word, behold. And it demands our attention. This song is classified, if you're interested in this kind of thing, by those who classify the genres of the Psalms, this is usually classified as a wisdom song. 
A wisdom song is uh, of that category because it doesn't directly correct your thinking. It doesn't uh, have any imperatives for you to obey in it. But like all great wisdom writing, it causes you to stop and it causes you to think and it makes you scratch your head. This song is a wisdom song because it acts, it tries to teach you by observing something. By observing and praising, by calling your attention, by saying, behold, this observation and this praising and celebrating is intended to provoke God's people to pursue unity and to remind us what we're missing in our lives when we lack that unity. This beholding is a declaration of the inherent beauty and value of spiritual unity. And what is it that he wants us to behold? How does he depict this spiritual unity? Look down at verse one. How good and how delightful when brothers dwell also at one. Brothers dwelling together in unity. A phrase he likely borrowed from Deuteronomy 25 verse five. A chapter that talks about actual brothers, kinsmen living together and gives them instruction on how they should react to trouble in the family. It helps them understand their responsibilities to one another. And so the psalmist taking this idea of the physical family, of literal brothers, of children of the same father, and extends this metaphor of a natural family and uses it to refer to those not only who live in proximity to each other, but who ought to be responsible for one another. The word brothers here is an expression of a familial connection, but the emphasis here is on that phrase dwelling together. There's something implied here that's closer than blood, a oneness of heart and purpose. There's no need to restrict this song too narrowly to its original avenue. It it purposefully moves towards a a grand and transcendent vision with its vivid illustrations and its climactic ending of, of life eternal. And because of its use by the pilgrims, as they would go about their journey, we can see why they would have to be reminded that they were a family. They were in this thing together. Consider the the problems that worshipers would face returning to Jerusalem from afar for these annual festivals and feasts. To prepare a family to travel many miles along ancient roads, sometimes accompanied by sacrificial animals and offerings for all the stuff a family would need to travel on foot a great distance, all the stuff that kids bring on a trip, the logistics of food and water and disagreements and whatever the ancient equivalent of arguing in the back seat was, they had that. And then Finally, if they survive the logistics of travel in the ancient world, the robbers and thieves along the way, they finally start to approach that mountain and they're singing this song and they finally arrive in Jerusalem, but their logistical issues had just begun. Imagine the congestion, the crowds, tempers could run high as travelers finally in Jerusalem, weary from their journey, families trying to stick together, meet up with relatives. No texting was happening back then. A a sea of humanity jostling and heads bobbing through the crowded streets as worshipers sought lodging and necessities for their week-long stay. And then after the whole thing is done, they have to return and go home. They needed a song like this. So do we. Sounds kind of like getting ready for church on Sunday, right, Pastor? And so this depiction of God's family being together is called good and pleasant or good and delightful. Good emphasizes that objective and inherent nature of unity. It is good in and of itself. This would recall God's assessment of creation in Genesis, that he looked upon what he had made and he pronounced it good. Pleasant emphasizes a more subjective experience. It could be translated delightful or lovely. We understand this. There's things that are good for us, exercise, but not pleasant exercise. There's things that are pleasant but not good for you. The list is too long to name. Unity, the psalmist teaches us, is both good and 
pleasant. This dwelling together needs to be seen by all of God's people then and now as something that is inherently and internally and intrinsically good, something worth beholding. Pastor, I know that you're concerned about this, and I know you call people regularly to the truth that the New Testament expands on about togetherness. And it's helpful to remind ourselves that the key and the prerequisite for plurality, for unity, for unity is to have a plurality. You have to be with God's people. And even pastors need to guard themselves from professional detachment. We can never grow weary of being with God's people. Hebrews 10 is for us too. The administrative realities that we face the problems that we can be wanting to step back from, it helps to be reminded of the amazing reality of what God accomplishes in uniting his people. Because before we are pastors, or if you prefer professional Christians, we are members of the church and believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and recipients of the glorious gospel. And we can never get over that And so when we hear these words, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together, we're reminded of the privilege it is to be among God's people. The inherent goodness depicted in this first verse is really rooted in who God is. I think that's why he uses the word good, such a loaded word in the Old Testament, because God is the one who is good. And so when he pronounces this, it's a reminder that our God, our good God, is a God of three persons. A God of three persons who is united in their great love for each other eternally. And theologians from Athanasius to Edwards have pointed to the existence of harmony in music as evidence of God's harmonious triunity. This is what, according to Jonathan Edwards, who is at least as smart as Albert (laughs) Moeller, Jonathan Edwards would say, is what makes music unutterably beautiful. Different notes sounding together pleasantly. Listen to Michael Reeves. In the lively harmony of the three persons, the radiant love, the overflowing goodness of this God, there is a beauty entirely at odds with the single person gods of of other world religions. And because this God has poured out his love and life, we can also say the triunity of God is the source of all beauty. What are the implications for this for spiritual unity in the church? Well, if melodious harmony in music is rooted in the Trinity, aren't every good human relationship, especially in the church, at their most ultimate expression, an expression of and a reflection of the triune God and his eternal love for one another? It is not optional to preach about spiritual unity. It is not optional to shepherd people toward togetherness. We need to hear God clearly say that it is good and pleasant when brethren dwell together. Spiritual unity is praiseworthy and it's something to behold because God is praiseworthy and he is something to behold. He is someone to behold. And so we move to the middle of this song and it shows us two portraits now of spiritual unity. We've seen that it's praiseworthy. Let's look at these two depictions or illustrations of this situation. How is it best described? Well, David decides to employ two liquid illustrations. The first one is about the precious oil upon the head. Precious oil, literally good or or excellent oil. It's a special fragrant oil that the Old Testament speaks about repeatedly in ritual. This illustration is about the oil of consecration. If you want to learn all about it, you read in Exodus 30, and there's lots of information. The recipe is given in Exodus 30 verse 1. It's expanded on with each ingredient carefully listed out how to make the anointing oil, the the mixture is described in that chapter. 
the articles of the Mishkan being all anointed with it is described in that chapter. The, the degrees of holiness that are required to use this particular oil, the priesthood is to be anointed with it, and only the priesthood. It was forbidden from anyone outside of the priesthood being anointed with this oil themselves or, or to even make it themselves. And then there's consequences in that chapter of what happens if anyone were to try to replicate this recipe or employ this sacred oil. The point is that it was special. And while our Pentecostal friends debate online if the prohibition from copying the recipe applies to them or not, or worse, before I'm approached by an essential oil enthusiast after this to (laughs) help cure my baldness, So it's happened to me more than once. (laughs) The point here is to know that the entire ceremony was demonstrating the ordination and involvement of God to set the high priest apart and to convey a sacred blessing on him with this symbol of the oil poured on his head. The oil was poured on his head to represent his consecration into priestly service. And that priest, in turn, was to represent, because by definition a priest is a representative, the people before God and God before the people. And so he stood before God as the entire nation, as all 12 tribes, a nation intended by God to be a priest-like people. And he had a beard. That's not because he's a hipster pastor. It was part of the uniform for a priest, though Spurgeon did say uh, growing a beard is a habit most natural, scriptural, manly, and beneficial. Amen? (laughs) And some of them said amen. For high priests, it wasn't a fashion statement. It was part of their uniform. The beard of the priest included the side locks, the edges, Leviticus 21, And as that oil was put on the priest's head and following the natural tendencies of both liquid and gravity, it would flow down onto his beard and even onto his garments. And then at the very center of this poem, which has a chiastic focus like so much Hebrew poetry, the emphasis of it goes down to the middle and right in the middle of this poem is Aaron's beard. And so a particular priest is now mentioned, even Aaron it says. Well, Aaron ramps up the significance of this picture because he was not only a high priest, he was the high priest. He was the first of all the priests. All the priests would follow his lead. Generation after generation, ministering before the Lord in the temple, all those priests, especially the high priest, represented the entire nation before Yahweh. They were all copying the exact injunctions that were given to Aaron in the first place. Aaron was the first one to wear on the ephod those 12 stones representing each of the tribes. He was the first one to have those black onyx stones inscribed with the names of the tribes of Israel on his shoulders. He was the first one to enter into that symbolic experience of the presence of God on the Day of Atonement. His ministry was a representative one offering gifts and sacrifices on behalf of the people, assuring them of the promised forgiveness and blessing that God would grant them. And so by employing the picture of Aaron, the first and greatest of the high priests, there's gravitas here. They would have thought of Moses anointing Aaron the first time Aaron was anointed, Moses himself. And the whole picture is is otherworldly. It's sacred. It's special. Moses himself anointing Aaron, that's what spiritual unity is like first and foremost. The figure of anointing, this is Derek Kidner, he says, portrays a people as differentiated but also as integrated, as a priest in his robes, a people among whom God's blessings are not the preserve of a few, but are free to spread and be shared, unifying the recipients all the more, just as the anointing oil intended for the head was not confined to it, nor could its fragrance be contained. This precious oil symbolized abundance. And the poetry here is emphasizing repetition and direction. Do you see the threefold use of the phrase going down on the beard, going down upon the opening of his robe, and going down upon the mountains of Zion? 
This sacredness is emphasized. This directional emphasis is is there from top to bottom. Unity is seen as spiritual and useful to God. Coming down upon, coming down upon. Unity and blessing were seen to be part and parcel of spiritual unity as divine gifts. And it's reminding everyone who's ever tasted the fragrant, wonderful experience of, of fellowship as the people of God, that true unity is sent down, not conjured up. It's not another program or a a small groups initiative or we got to address these 53 things and then maybe we can get this together. No, no, no. True unity comes from God himself. Unity is spiritual. In other words, it's sacred. It's set apart. And it is a blessing that God bestows on his people. Unity finds its origin from above and that's why it's so praiseworthy. This illustration reminds us of what we know from the New Testament in Ephesians chapter four. Remember what he said? As he called them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which they've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of what? Your church's branding? The unity of what? Everybody behind that pastor's personality? No, no, the unity of the spirit. Unity isn't something that we can create. It's a work of the spirit. It is God wrought. The spirit creates it, and it's the believer's responsibility to maintain it. And that begins with savoring its inherent worth, its divine goodness, acknowledging its source and strength is from above as God unifies his people. There's also a portrait in this poetry of abundance, isn't there? And isn't fellowship just like that? In little churches and big churches doesn't have a a tendency, just like this oil, to spill all over the place. Our churches, if you look at them from the outside, are absurd little places where old ladies and and college students, where people from different racial backgrounds and different economic positions are all coming together and singing the same gospel songs, male and female, black and white, introvert and extrovert, all united together in love. And that fellowship has a tendency to expand. It goes out into the parking lot. It's in the homes during the week. And it reminds us that true spiritual unity, true fellowship among God's people is abundant. It's a gift from God. It's divine. And like every good and perfect gift, it's from above. And unity has this pleasing fragrance. Its inherent goodness is related to its divine origin. Unity is abundant and generous. And fellowship has that tendency not to be contained and reserved for the in crowd, but readily embraced as we wrap our arms around the people in our churches who are the least of these. And that fellowship expands as we love one another throughout the week and not just on the Lord's day. Unity makes your church smell good. Brothers, how are you modeling this? Is the leadership of your church so evidently committed to one another that it can't help but go from head to beard to edges of rope. It has an expansive tendency. Are you modeling this in the brotherhood of the, of the elders of the church, of those who are serving the people of God? Are you a unifier? Are you known for that? Do you pray for other local churches in your area? Are you known to be a man who's not about your particular corner, but about God's work going on around your city and around the world? This is something we need to prioritize before God's people, not because we can create unity, but because we need to display unity. If you love God, you'll love to be with God's people. We tell them all the time, don't we, that Christianity isn't a lone ranger religion that they need to be in fellowship. 
It's why we press on folks here at this church from this spot every uh, Sunday night, once a month, the importance of of, ch- of church membership, and we call people to join the body formally and officially, and that's only because it is a outworking of a commitment to true spiritual unity. And we heard it from the men this morning. Pastors need other pastors. We too are church members, and we need friendships that model this kind of love and sacrifice for one another. How do you feel about those church plants that are in every single middle school that surrounds your church? Are you for those? Have you prayed for their success? Have you taken that hipster pastor with a beard who looks like he's in middle school out to coffee yet? (laughs) Do you desire for that place to thrive as an outpost for the gospel? Or do they get under your skin? Because if the apostle Paul could praise God that the gospel was being preached by those who were intentionally preaching it for the sole means of keeping him in prison? It's a strong example for us. Unity is a pleasing aroma. It's holy, it's sacred. We can't chalk up this unity in the body to life in a fallen world. We need to show our people how gloriously divine it is. Look at verse three. This is the second illustration like the dew of Hermon going down upon the mountains of Zion. The dew of Hermon going down upon the mountains of Zion. Another liquid illustration. This one is those droplets of water that appear on grass and surfaces in the morning or evening due to condensation. Atmospheric moisture condenses faster than it can evaporate, resulting in the formation of water droplets. Wikipedia. (laughs) And this is all happening in a particular place, a place called Hermon. That was the highest peak in Israel, Mount Hermon at 9,232 feet above sea level. What do you call these water droplets on Hermon? Well, it's Mountain Dew. And that's why you don't have the youth pastor preach at Shepherd's Conference. (laughs) But what's happening here? Whether the highest peak in Israel, Mount Hermon, 9,000 feet, or this comparatively insignificant Mount Zion, both enjoyed the same gift of dew. But come with me for a moment to Mount Hermon to understand this illustration. Mount Hermon was snow-capped. Beautiful, way up north in Israel, precipitous and verdant in the summer, the perfect place for a getaway. The dew there was abundant compared to the dew in very arid Jerusalem on Mount Zion. To think of Hermon for them was to think of one of the most beautiful places within their reach, a place where it would snow in the winter, a place where there was natural refreshment, And so with this picture comes this concept of unity's ability to be so life-giving, to be marked by vitality. If the first illustration reminds us of the sacred nature of this unity, this one is telling us and reminding us that unity is portrayed as life-giving. It's a blessing. It's supporting. It's strengthening. But Remember, this is poetry. You need to read between the lines here. He's not saying the dew of Hermon comes down upon the mountains of Zion like it's some kind of depiction of the ancient understanding of a hydrological cycle. That's not how it worked. It's 100 miles away. The dew didn't go from there down the way up the hill to Zion. He's saying it's as if those verdant conditions beautiful and refreshing conditions, that kind of rain, that kind of dew came to our little desert hill. That's what this experience was like as these pilgrims went up, went up, went up to Mount Zion, went up to worship, went up for fellowship, went up for sacrifice, went up to receive the blessing at this place where heaven meets earth. It was as if they were at this other place, so rich, so blessed, so beautiful, 
That's the portrait of the wonderful refreshment that's common with true spiritual unity, life-giving, blessing, supporting and strengthening, providing growth and stimulation. To me, it sounds exactly like Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for we promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works as not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Pastor, you work there. You work there every day. But a Sunday at church should be more spiritually refreshing than a weekend in the woods or a trip to the lake. It's a reminder and it's a convicting one that tells us that this precipitous and snow-capped and lush and verdant mountain in the far north of Israel was nothing compared to the sweetness of the crowded, dusty fellowship happening outside of the location of the temple. This dry and arid hill that hardly got rain at all has Hebron-like conditions because it's Zion. It's the place where God issues his blessing, literally like the dew of Hermon going down upon the mountains of Zion. It's like snow in LA, in July, it's not gonna happen. But if it did, it would be divine. Alec Motier describes it this way. The second illustration deals with a miracle. Hermon's dew falling on Zion's hill. Hermon was the chief mountain of the north, Zion the chief mountain of the south. That they should be united in this way could only be an act of God. Such then, said David, is the unity of the family of God's people, a God-wrought miracle. Unity is life-giving, and it produces an atmosphere that is sweet. It's what we know from 1 John 3, 14, isn't it? We know we've crossed over from death to life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love remains in the realm of death. To John, evidence of salvation is love for brothers and sisters in Christ, and he calls it life. To guard and protect that which God has accomplished is the charge to us from hearing a song like this one. We need to teach our people and model for our people the importance of spending time together of simply reading the Bible together, of praying together, of being committed to one another. That's the portraits of spiritual unity. Finally, let's look at the power of spiritual unity. The last piece of this song, the final part of verse three. It's an explanation. He says, because there Yahweh commanded the blessing, life forever. Life forever. There. The word there is an immediate reference to the location of the blessing as Zion connects back to that blessing formula in verse one. There, God commands the blessing of life forever. He's talking about Zion. He's talking about the experience of spiritual unity coming down. There, God commands the blessing of life forevermore. Well, there's plenty of blessings, inherent ones, that attend spiritual unity, aren't there? I mean, it's a blessing in and of itself. It has an inherent sweetness to it. Why does he highlight this particular blessing, the blessing of eternal life? One commentator says that some interpreters take the phrase implying not personal immortality, but the ever-continuing vitality of the community. That might be right, but vitality is the point, I think, of the second illustration. Why does he say God, Yahweh, his covenant name, commands the blessing, life forevermore? This is how I understand it. The blessing falls by Yahweh's command. And I hear that phrase, Yahweh's command, and I know Isaiah 46, God's word accomplishes what he intends it to accomplish. There's a sovereignty to God's word. And so when Yahweh speaks, he accomplishes. The blessing falls by Yahweh's command. When God says life, it happens every time. The other key to understanding this is that phrase, 
Yahweh command the blessing, life forever, pointing back to there, Zion. Zion is key. Zion is that place that pictured and portrayed the dwelling place of God. It's where the temple would be constructed. It's where the tabernacle was placed. It was the holy city. Zion was the place where heaven met earth. He is not saying that unity creates eternal life. What he is saying is that when we relish and cherish the unity that God relishes and cherishes, we share in his sort of life. That unity among God's people is a foretaste of heaven. This is why we have to be so zealous to always guard against harm or division in the body. It's why we're so committed to preserving peace and love and joy in the fellowship. It's why true spiritual unity, fellowship, is the concern of a song like this one. But we're mindful that we're in the Old Testament, aren't we? That the people who sang this song, walking up that holy hill, all shared the same DNA. They were a tribe and a nation who was united naturally. They knew a kind of unity in Israel, but it was only in part. It was a foretaste of a unity that would come in the new covenant as the Spirit of God is poured out on all of God's people. All are made partakers and participants, all united under their great high priest Jesus, who prayed to his Father for their perfect unity to be a witness of their unbreakable connection to the triune God and to one another. We experience something so far beyond what they experienced in their national uh, occurrence of this. God united those people, but he was planning for something greater. He would have us drink deeply from the gospel, my friends, and we would know, hearing David's song about something he only knew in part, because we would see the gospel break down that dividing wall, transcending racial, and ethnic distinctions, not erasing them, but uniting us and bringing us in to part of the salvation plan of God. So in the end, we see worshipers gathered and described in the book of Revelation as being from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. In the church, unity is not uniformity. It is a taste of heaven to come. It's why Jesus prayed in John 17 that they all of them, present and future followers, may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me and the glory that you've given me I have given them so that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may completely be one so that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them even as you love me. In John 17, that true spiritual unity is a fulfillment of the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ to his Father, and that unity has an audience that this world may know. I mean, the ironic tragedy for our author was that David would experience the opposite of this song. His own house would be divided, his son, a usurper and a rebel, even unto death, to kill his own brother. To fulfill that judgment, a sword shall never depart from your house. But David knows it now, doesn't he? What David knows now, he saw only in a glimmer. And what we experience now, even in our churches, in the glory of the new covenant, is really only a foretaste, isn't it? I mean, oil and dew are one thing, but to see God's plan unfold in heaven, heaven, a world of unity and fellowship and love and the ultimate expression of unity being shown as God brings his people together and unites them by his Holy Spirit because of the death and resurrection of that greater high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then ultimately eradicates every sin that divides and disturbs true unity to bring his people together 
Jew and Gentile into one body. Christ is all and is in all for all eternity in perfect concord. This world cries for world peace, for harmony among all peoples. And what they need to hear is that the gospel is the only way they'll ever see it. Christ is all and is in all for all eternity in concord and harmony and peace and unity, best described in the words of verse three as life forever. The worship and fellowship and joy we share here and in our local churches and in thousands of Christian churches gathered all over the planet every Sunday is a foretaste of the eternal life and praise we will have forever in the presence of Christ. So come quickly, Lord Jesus, and bring the full fruition of unity to your people as you promised. In the meantime, may we see it and savor its expression to foster it and to guard it with the strength of grace. In Jesus' name, amen.